Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about The Mandalorian Season 2. Now I had finished the series, but it was one of those Season 2 things that I let slip by and I didn't do a podcast on. I did a podcast on the first episode of Season 1 and the whole of Season 1 in general. This is something I watched again recently and... I was like, oh, I didn't get to do the podcast. Uh, let me do it now. So I might be a little more in-depth in this one, just a little more um, observant of things. A lot of times you watch them and I just turn the mic on. It's just the way I do things. Um, looking at this in retrospective and the first season, I get this feeling that this show was retooled. I got the feeling what they tried to do from... George Lucas's old stuff, which he started to do in 2009 called The Underworld. And going into production on The Mandalorian, I think there was a big change. Because Season 2 does not stop with these short episodes. And it is the Achilles heel of this show. So first off, I'll say, like Season 1, love Season 2. There are lots of little things wrong with this show. However, I think this show's flaws are becoming part of its charm. All the reoccurring tropes, the themes, the cheesiness, uh, the sometimes seriousness, and it, it seems to become part of its charm. And it being short is the only thing, I think, holding anything back. And I don't think it ruins the show or lowers its whatever fucking rating score in that sense, but I look at it and go, what a crime. This is, what, eight minutes here? You can't add a little bit of dialogue? I'm not sure what they're going for. If they're going for annoying people, it's probably the way to go. And when you're releasing once a week these days, I just don't see it. So right off the bat, I'll say that from the beginning. I like season one a lot. I kind of love season two. But make these fucking episodes longer. Enough with this 26 minutes, 32 minutes, when you can consider the ads or whatever the fuck they're doing. Just enough already. Now, getting into season two, well, let's talk about the um, general things. It's created by John Favreau. And it stars Pedro Pascal. And it has a, tons of actors that come in and out of the show. Um, you know, Carl Weathers, Gina Carano, who's gone now. And she put her own foot in her mouth. She had plenty of fucking warnings. And if you don't like that, too fucking bad. I didn't like her character that much anyway. Especially in season two. But a lot of people did like her. And look, everything's not for me. Fine. But when you got people like Dave Filoni on it, you get a little bit of confidence. Now, I fell off of the Rebels animated show. I just couldn't take it no more by the end of it. I didn't even care. I still don't care to go back and watch it. And could that be part of the Lucasfilms or the not, not even Lucasfilms anyway, Disney sequels? So I'll briefly go over that. I'm a Star Wars nerd. I'm 50 years old. Grew up with it. Saw them in the movies. Had the dolls, the action figures, the whole nine yards. Love all the books, which are called Legacy now, which are way better than the garbage they put out now. The original comics, everything. Big fan. Got I got lots of lightsaber replicas in my house. Even the ones that light up and, you know, they're, they're somewhat um, professional or better. Really big fan. I give the prequels a pass in the sense that I love things about certain things, but I don't give them a critical acclaim. I look at them and go, okay, this is George's vision, fine. Doesn't mesh what I wanted, but I got some great stuff out of it, and I'll treat it like that. And I do watch them. The Clone Wars, maybe, well, the second one, maybe not too much, but the first one and third one I watch a lot. Oh, I don't let them go by. The Force Awakens, I loved it. Thought it was not for me, and it was a rehash, but it was done well. And how charming is... Um, some of, the, some of these characters and their performances. Although I think they made huge mistakes. You don't take an actor like Finn, whoever played Finn, and take a stormtrooper who 
on his first mission decides, I can't do this, and it becomes a buffoon comedy actor of the show. For all three fucking movies. That's bullshit. You take Phasma, people who loved her, you got her promoting this fucking thing, and you shit all over her. So, fuck the sequels, and in retrospect, it kind of ruins The Force Awakens now. And that's a personal thing, fine. But my love and excitement for Star Wars going forward is just gone. It was just destroyed. Here comes The Mandalorian. Holy shit, lots of fun. You can listen to my podcast on the first season. Now, going into the second season, I was excited. I got something I like. It's Star Wars. It's, it's, it seems like it was made for me. Besides the nitpicks about some of the music and the editing and its fucking short runtime, this is a fun, enjoyable show on so many levels. They got some great special effects, practical effects, characters that come in, actors, it all fits right. And the one thing that mars this is Kathleen Kennedy's name on this fucking show as even a producer or anything. Keep her name away from fucking Star Wars. Fuck her and her fucking cuntiness. She can go fuck herself. So you can put this in the adult fucking version too. She should be fucking fired a long time ago for that fucking travesty that's called The Last Jedi and the Hail Mary they tried which bombed in so many ways The Rise of Skywalker what bullshit nonsense but here we are in The Mandalorian season 2 we continue with The Mandalorian and now Grogu since we know his name uh, by episode 5 I think I might even touch on some of the things real quick because I want to give a flavor and an idea of how I felt as I'm watching it. So, right off the bat, you get the first episode called uh, The Marshal, I think. And holy shit, we have Timothy Oliphant playing The Marshal, playing off the tropes from Deadwood. And the show is in itself like Western. It's really... Uh, good at hitting those points that make you feel like a western and i might have described that in my first one but i'll reiterate it here i love westerns this is right up my alley it's fucking awesome for that timothy oliphant's the marshal he's got spoilers yes this whole fucking thing will be spoilers basically he's got boba fett's armor so apparently the jawas scavenge the armor from the scarlet pit whatever the fuck and um, his character, the marshal, when he got into some trouble, almost was almost killed, and he was picked up by the Jawas, and they took his equipment and said, "Oh, well, we'll trade you some of this." And he didn't want nothing, but he picks out Boba Fett's armor. They had it in their fucking truck thing that drives around. It's awesome, and to see all the familiar places, you know, Tatooine it doesn't feel overused. It doesn't feel out of place, or you know. I remember this type stuff. It just feels really good seeing these places and the characters. And we got a great episode. It's fucking awesome. They got to work together. It's a little bit of a stare off right from Deadwood. Um, and Timothy Oliphant is amazing. I love him in almost everything. They got to fight a crate dragon. I mean, right from the Knights of the Old Republic game, or it's the skull and bones you see when R2 and um, C3PO are going across the desert. Just uh, all around, great fucking episode. And it continues with The Passenger. This show is hitting it on all fucking... On every cylinder. It's directed by John Favreau. And then you got Peyton Reed. You've got Bryce D Dallas Howard, who does a pretty good fucking show, which introduces Bo-Katan. Now, in the second one, which is called The Passenger... There is a little bit of um, callbacks to other movies and stuff, and it's really, really fucking good. I love that they're doing it. I don't find it, the cheesiness, overwhelming for me. And yes, I can, I can understand if people are watching it going, hey, you know, they roll their eyes and stuff, fine. But episode two, really good. Loved what they did with it. The fucking kid, the little baby Grogu going around fucking with these fucking spider-like eggs and it turns into like a horror movie. Just excellent. 
Now, like I said, the third one, um, the Harris, the Ahiris, the Harris, directed by Bryce Dallas Howard, introduces Bo Katan. Now, this is the other shortcoming the show might have. If you someone like me who's watched the Clone Wars, who watched almost all of Rebels and some tie-ins and things like that, read some of the comics. I know who Bo Katan is, and I get that Katie Sackhoff is the voice. She is the character. She's amazing in the show. But you don't have enough time. I don't fucking get it. How can you get people who are going to not know what's going on and you're going to have to what? <clears throat> catch up with her and kind of figure things out by another episode? It is in itself a week's point. But they do it great. The show's fucking. The show was great. I love the episode. Too fucking short. And to see this um, first interactions of, hey, we're Mandalorians, but we take off our fucking helmets, and you're part of some like religious cult. You know, you're, you're fanatics in that sense. And you start to get the impression of what is going on in the Mandalorian's head. He won't take off his helmet. You find out through the whole first season. He nearly, uh, you know, threatens people, you know, even when he's dying. You know, I, don't, I haven't showed my face to another human being. Well, to a certain extent, that thing. And he lets the droid, because the droid says, I'm not, and that's first season. Anyway, so, Bogotan is introduced. We have a whole slew of um, new Mandalorians, Blue Hama. She's got this uh, design on her helmet that's unique for her. And it's fucking awesome. They even do some name drops in here that you know what's coming up, and holy shit. Just a great episode. Uh, the Siege. Now, the first season had a, uh, a, a so-so episode, which was like, uh, I don't know, the one with the fucking, I think it's called Gunslinger. It was like they got this half ass actor to do uh, some betrayal shit as a newly, uh, you know, bounty hunter. He's trying to make his name. Uh, this season, I don't think it has that. It's just so fucking good. Uh, the next one would be called uh, The Siege. This is directed by Carl Weathers. Holy shit. Really fucking knocks it out of the park. Really good, fun adventure. Get the people together. Look, uh, man, I'll give you a deal. Uh, we'll squash everything. You help me get these Imperials out. And blah, 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 blah. And there's some betrayal. There's some twisty twisties. And just a real fun, action-packed episode. Uh, you know, you find out some things about what the uh, remnants of the Empire are doing, and the kind of what the fuck moments too, where you see like these vats and like, is this fucking Snoke? Is this like the Emperor? Because we know what happens now in the fucking Rise of Shitwalker. Love the episode, and then we get to the probably the best episode. Uh. Episode 5, The Jedi. Now, this is directed by Dave Filoni and written by Dave Filoni. Now, most of the episodes are written by John Favreau. This is Dave Filoni's character, his baby. Beloved character. She started in the Clone Wars, kind of hated and not liked, and became one of the most beloved characters in Star Wars. This is a Twilight Jedi Padawan of Anakin's in the Clone Wars. She goes through her thing, and a long story short, she leaves the Jedi from disagreements and things going on. They reintroduce her in Rebels, where she confronts Darth Vader, and the connection is made, and she realizes who it is, and she walks away from everything. Again, I know her. I love her character. I know so much about her from all ancillary products and all this the franchise in general not many people fucking do how much time do you give these episodes for fuck's sake just mind-boggling in that sense but the show an episode is fucking amazing to see what ahsoka katana was that a fucking ashoka katana can do what she can do uh the the level of um depth to everything, the atmosphere of the planets, just the 
atmosphere they create with her lightsabers, which are white, and they the way they put darkness and she is fucking terrifying in that aspect. Done so well, and then they bring Michael Bean in from Terminator and um, uh, Tombstone, basically, and they split this episode with uh, a samurai type thing with Ahsoka and the leader of these uh, this empire, who she needs information from, and the Mandalorian and this mercenary, and it's that's Western part, and it's done over this little uh, stronghold. Everything is so good. The visuals, the props. I mean, everything. Yes, cheesiness, overload, tropes, themes. <clears throat> they run rampant through the show. But it's done so well. Just fucking awesome. My, probably my favorite episode of the whole series, The Jedi. Let me get to episode six, directed by Robert Rodriguez. Yeah, I'm a, uh, he's a favorite of mine. Um, as a director. Now, he's told in chapter... Well, okay, so the story connects with Bo-Katan telling him, uh, the Mandalorian at the end, you gotta go see um, Ahsoka Tana. So he goes, that's why he's headed there at the end of the episode. So when he meets Ahsoka in episode 5, he helps her, they help each other, and she connects with Grogu and tells him his name and says, look, I can't teach him or train him. He has to go to this place and maybe... Uh, someone will um, feel his presence in the force and come and help you or whatever. And I I don't know if the show, again, is retooled or restructured, but I got the impression that in the first season and the second season, when when they talked about, and I think it's the mother Mandalorian, the blacksmith, when they talk about, the Mandalorian's purpose now is to bring him back to his kind. I total I assumed from the beginning it meant his race of be his race, the Yoda race, whatever the fuck they are. And it's one of those things I think George Lucas never um told anybody. He never revealed it, so and he is uh, given credit on this show as someone who helped in that sense. So I don't know. Um uh, it seems to be now that when they met, said his kind, they meant the Jedi. And I was a little surprised at that. Like, it just didn't feel right. Like, And again, it could just be, oh, my mind made up the story and that's not where they were going. But that's the impression they gave to me. Well, that's how I felt. I interpreted it. So here, the Mandalorian's got to bring him to a planet. And he sits on a rock, communes with the Force. And a force field goes up around him as he's doing his thing. And here we get a callback, a reveal that people love. I like it, although I have some misgivings about certain things. And I'll get to that maybe at the end when I talk about what the spinoffs are going to be. So we find out <clears throat> that Fennec, one of my favorite actresses who's in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., by the way, um, God, what are I fucking, I don't know what fucking name is, um, but she's a great actress, she plays a thing she's left for dead in the first season, and at the end of the episode, you see these boots and a cape of some sort go over to her body. So she's reintroduced because Boba Fett and Slave One shows up. And he wants his fucking armor. She's got Grogu under the scope. They confront each other, the Mandalorian and Boba. And I, I liked it. And it's Django Fett, the actor from the show, because it's a clone of him. So it all works. They put a little bit of, oh, he must have been damaged from the digestive juices. And in the previous episodes, they put a tracker on Mandalorian ship. So they track him in, stormtroopers show up. The uh, Boba Fett agrees to help him protect the child if he gives him the armor. And there's an explanation here in some uh, exposition and reveals that Boba 
and his father weren't really considered Mandalorians, but his father was, I think, considered a foundling, like our Mandalorian is. Din Djarin is his, is his name. In any case, he's he gives the Mandalorian enough information that the Mandalorian agrees, okay, then the armor does belong to you. Even though you're not part of the sect, and you're not part of Bo-Katan's things, his father earned something or got some right, and the arm is his, and he deserves it. So they agree to help each other. Help me protect the child. And we get some badass, fucking awesome scenes. Boba Fett and Fennec helping the Mandalorian. Just excellent stuff. And then in between the fighting, um, it gets bad because another more stormtroopers come. And Boba comes out in his armor. Knee rockets. Where the fuck did these things come from? It clearly just animated. Someone came up with the fucking idea. It looks ridiculous, but it all works in the episode as they're really getting tired. They're, they're fighting these um, stormtroopers off who are obviously shitty, but in enough numbers, they could fuck you up. The Mandalorian goes to get Grogu, but he can't get through the force field. It nearly knocks him out or, or puts him out for a couple minutes. So he goes and helps. Boba and Fennec, and then the dark troopers come and take Grogu, and that's it. But something important happens, and it's really heartbreaking. They bombard the planet from orbit and destroy the Razor Crest, which is the Mandalorian ship, and your heart just comes out of you like, what? No, no. And I'm not a big fan of the Slave One, but I kind of like the Razor Crest. It just sort of fit this show and Mandalorian. But his, show, his ship is destroyed. He's got to get on with Boba Fett and Fennec. And they help to pursue the um, Grogu. The kid. Well, we call him the kid, but he's 50 fucking years old. But it's like when you're playing a D&D with the elves, you know, who lived to, let's say, 6,000. You know, what do you say? Oh, at 90 years old or a teenager or... You know, you get some framework of that. So you got a being whose race lives to about 900. Well, 50 is still childlike to them. So they call him, you know, it's the kid. There's, um, like I said, so much to like about this episode. We reveal that Boba Fett's alive. I don't know. If something doesn't sit well with me in there, but I don't have any um, major drawbacks that make me not enjoy this episode immensely so Grogu is taken Mandalorian's got no ship he's got to turn to Boba and Fennec and he's got to go get help so we go into the seventh episode the believer now who would have fucking thought Bill Burr a comedian comedic actor voice actor huge talent would have one of the best Scenes in Star Wars, period. End. His character in the first season, as someone they use to break in, they go to get a prisoner to break him out. He double crosses the Mandalorian with the team. Mandalorian turns it back on them. It's a really good episode. A uh, lot of great actors in that episode. And it's left that he's imprisoned. And when this starts, or the other one ends, Mandalorian goes to um, Gina Carano's character and says, I need help. He, she starts looking at the computer for someone who could track the ship, who has protocols of the Empire, and Bill Burr's character was one of them. So they go to this planet, and it's a really cool little thing when Boba and um, Gina Carano's character come out and speak to the, you know, the people in charge. And they call over Bill Burr's character for a second. He's surprised when he sees Boba. And he's like, oh, phew. And I thought, I, you remind me of someone I knew. And then the Mandalorian we know comes out. And he, she's like, oh, fuck. Anyway, you got to help me. We've got to find out. They took the kid. Blah, 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 blah. What choice does he have? He's breaking rocks. You know, the whole thing. I'm working here. Uh, uh, what did I watch? I watched the couple of reviews. I don't know who it was. I don't give credit, but it's like, you know, Space Boston. <laughs> Just great shit. And he's so good. His character is so good. But what they do with him here is monumental. It's 
incredible. It is a... You know, this is the seventh episode. You only got one more episode left. The episodes are so fucking short. It's fucking ridiculous. They gotta get him out. Get him to this planet. Get into an installation. Get the information they need. Get out and they'll be able to track where the baby is, right? So to get to the planet, oh, we have to infiltrate. So we have to make believe we're uh, Empire. They get in these fucking transport vehicles that are transporting highly volatile um, chemicals or whatever. Um, materials to make bombs and shit. So they get in, they're driving, and you find out that the planet is rebelling or having their own terrorists, and they're fucking up these ships, and these huge explosions start happening, and the transports are getting fucking blown up. And they go too fast, and the stuff gets volatile. Which is in itself kind of ridiculous because when explosions are happening all over, the thing will just explode. I mean, but okay, you go too fast, the cargo will explode. You're dead. Huge explosion. But if these guys throw ther- thermal detonators at you, you're dead anyway. So the Million DeLorean gets on top, tries to shoot some the fucking weapon, goes fucked up. Hand to hand combat, and he's not in his Mandalorian armor. And here and there, he's getting beat up here and there. But they manage to get by and then a whole new group comes and they're all ready to throw their detonators at him and this awesome music comes on and they're saved by TIE fighters and you find yourself cheering going hold on wait a second why am I cheering for the fucking Empire there's a great twist and perspective change of what it's like wartime who's the terrorist who's the good guy what their actual dealings are and you're caught up in this. And it's the point is brought really to fruition when they get in, they're cheered as heroes, which is kind of unsettling. The Mandalorian doesn't want to take off his helmet, but Bill Burr the whole time is like, you know, it looks better without your fucking helmet. And so they get into the installation. Now they have their window. They got to go to this data port, put a, you know, fucking stick drive in, get the data, boom, and they're out. So Bill Burr's character goes in, sees uh, someone he worked under, turns right back out. <laughs> you know, it looks ridiculous. And he's like, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. I served under that guy. Yeah, you know, way. And the Mandalorian says, I'll do it. He's like, no, no. You know. And the, the concern is, as the Mandalorian walks in to do it, and he's trying to get the port, it won't unless it scans his face. So this is a moment, a real character development. Um... The Mandalorian Din Djarin takes off his helmet to save the kid. And he doesn't care who in this order, because it's a cafeteria. Everybody's eating, you know, drinking, things like that. <clears throat> and he's at this podium making everybody looking. He looks strange. He's a little nervous. So he takes his helmet off, he scans his face, he gets the data, and he pulls it out, he turns to leave. And one of these lieutenant, great actor, great casting. By the way, the casting is great. Imperials all over the place. Just They should win awards for that. He confronts the, the Mandalorian without his helmet. And he starts talking to him. And the Mandalorian is fumbling because he doesn't know anything. He's not prepared for this. So Bill Burke comes in and saves him with his quick, wise, cracking, talking. He knows the protocol. He knows the divisions. All the... I got do my, we got to fill out the TPP papers and all that type of stuff. And it seems like it's going well. And then he goes, wait, there's this tense moment. And he goes, the, the evil guy, the lieutenant guy, whatever the fuck he is, great uniforms, you know, right from the movies. Let's have a drink. And you're like, oh, shit. Whew. Got out of this. So he sits down and they're drinking. And here comes the moment that gives you chills. It's. So written so well, it elevates the show. If the last episode was great because of Ahsoka Tano, the Jedi, just seeing what they did, splitting the story, Samurai Western, learning about things. This one is the peak of this writing, what you can do when you care about something, you take the time. Now, this episode is directed by Rick Famuyua, and directed and written by him. So I'm going to give him this credit. 
and yeah, give John Favreau credit, but holy shit, you sit down there having a drink, and you start realizing why Bill Burr left the Empire. And apparently they're drawing everything they can. They're taking some elements from video games, from legacy stuff that's not canon no more, making it canon. And this story stems from one of the video games. I think it's Battlefront. It's called Operation Cinder, where the Empire loses after losing because the show takes place like five, af- five years after Return of the Jedi. And after the remnants of the Empire uh, uh, lose loss, they start feeding on their own and attacking their own and killing their own people to get resources and weapons and stuff. And that's when Bill Burr left. You know, his friends died, and it was he had this ideal of the Empire, and they just cannibalized themselves and murder and families destroyed, and he always resents them. But what starts to happen in this conversation is the Empire guy is actually proud of it. And as Bill Burr is talking to him, giving him a different perspective, you feel it building up, and the Mandalorian is sitting there without his helmet, and he's turning to Bill Burr's character, and you can see him going, stop this, don't do this. It builds up, and you get goosebumps. It's one of the best fucking moments in the show, hands down. Bill Burr pulls out his weapon and shoots the guy point blank dead, and you're fucking... In or this is done so well. The lead up, the build up, the conversation. Bill Burr is fucking acting. His mannerism. He fits in here. Space Boston to the rescue. Holy shit. I can't say enough good things about this episode, about the writing, about the perspective and the 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 what you get out of this episode is fucking awesome. Bill Burr point blank kills this fucking guy. And the whole cafeteria becomes silent. There's a fucking guy on a tray with a, a milk carton. And they go bananas and start shooting everybody. Holy shit. So they gotta escape. Out fucking windows. They're getting covered by um, Fennec and Gina Carano's character. You know, that's how I know <laughs> Fennec's character name. I can't remember the actress's name. But. I call Gina Carano by her real name, but can't remember her <laughs> character's name. Oh boy, this is just a fucking amazing feat they did. Uh, Bill Burr is Migs Mayfield. I mean, this is just um, a Cara Dune is Gina Carano. Uh, oh, Ming Na Wen. It's Fennec. She's from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. She played May, Melissa May. I fucking love her. Love most of these people. It's fucking amazing. Holy shit. Episode 7, The Believer. Hands down, one of the best written characters. Plots. The perspective change. The in-depth, the feelings of being in the Empire. Being on different fucking sides, but on the same side. It, It just... Really fascinating, fucking awesome. This is one of the best episodes for writing, character development, and holy shit, Bill Burr. Congratulations. Holy shit. This should be given awards. I mean, it's that fucking good. I love it that much. Holy shit. They get out, they got the information, and then there's a real cool scene at the end. Uh, the Mandalorian and Cara Dune are standing there and they're like looking at each other and they're totally ignoring Bill Burr and they're like, oh, it's a shame officer. I mean, prisoner 57221 died in this attempt. And he's looking around. He's like, Bill Burr's like, y- y- you're going to kill me? I'm, I'm right here. He's like, and they kind of ignore him and they're like, yeah, he died. And he's like, I, I can go. And the uh, Mandalorian nuts. So they let him go. I hope he comes back. Holy shit. Bill fucking Burr. I mean, by the way, this show has better characters than all the sequels. All of them. I grant it. I give The Force Awakening its charm and its credit. Daisy Ridley, Ray, performance is fucking spectacular. Finn could have been great. I love him as an actor. Poe, you had the potential for fucking greatness. And you shit on it. And you let it go to fucking garbage 
It can be dumpster fire of bullshit and crap. This shows side characters, the characters they have for five minutes. In, in, the, in the previous episode, they're getting the information with Bo Katan. They get on the ship, and you got this guy from Lost, this great actor, playing for five fucking minutes uh, a commander of a repub- uh, ship. And um, they break in, and he contacts Moff Gideon, who's the big bad, and he's like, uh, We got the Imperial, uh, we got the Mandalorians, or we got some people on the ship. And. He's like, you know what to do. You're already compromised. And the guy goes, but the Empire, long live the Empire. And he shoots his two fucking pilots, bites on his teeth. He got the fucking thing and he kills himself. Like these side characters, they're there for minutes, seconds, but you can feel. I think John like was almost in this fucking episode and you wouldn't even notice him or the previous. You just don't notice him. He's in all the makeup. This is a labor of love. This episode is fucking amazing. It still gives me the best moments of a character development, reveal, perspective than any of these fucking movies done have done. I mean, George Lucas tried in the prequels with the, uh, you know, the governments and the, you know, all that stuff, and it kind of failed. But holy shit, this is a, a fucking what thirty five fucking minute episode, like ridiculously short. All of them, even the ones that are like forty something minutes, you still want fucking more. They did this all in this fucking episode. It's fucking amazing. Bill Barr, congratulations. Rick Fumihuma, Famuiwa, fucking amazing. John Favreau, credit. Hey, Kathleen Kennedy's fucking name is on this. If it happens under her watch, fine. Give her credit. That's how fucking good it is. Holy shit. It's amazing. Now let's move on to the last one The Rescue. Here, I'm a little. I'm a little up and down on this. This episode is uh, directed by Peyton Reed and uh, written by John Favreau. Hope I'm not getting that. Yeah, it's directed. Okay. Now, uh, Cara Dune, the Mandalorian, they got uh, they capture a shuttle with this doctor that's a reoccurring character, clone guy from Camino. He's not one of their race, but he wears the patch as a symbol. All the fucking Easter eggs and way better sleuths out there put the pieces together. Um, uh, they capture the shuttle. They get Bo-Katan's help, who only brings one fucking Mandalorian with her, which is fucking ridiculous, but okay. And they're going to go rescue Grogu. So they go to uh, Moff Gideon's cruiser. And Moff Gideon has the dark saber. It was revealed in the end of the first season as he cuts his way out of the ship. And it's revealed that Bo-Katan wants the thing. That's another little thing, side plots that's going on, which is way short. Like, there is a problem at the time, and it will take points off or, you know, lower some scores on this. I'm sorry, it's just going to have to. However, they go, they get on the ship, they're doing what they got to do. It's action-packed, great stuff. They find out that Moff Gideon has a whole platoon of these robot uh, Cylons, I like to call them. Uh, Just robot powerhouses. Incredible. They let one get out, and they just show the power of it. Just to let you know, they're way out of their league. They're able to jettison them all into space, but one gets loose, nearly kills everybody, and the Mandalorian. Holy shit, these things are fucking real threat. They were able to get their way through as they jettison them all. They confront Gideon, and I didn't know if I mentioned it, but it's revealed that Beskar metal can block lightsabers. And when Ahsoka fought this, I don't know, military person, this woman, she had a Beskar spear. So now it's Mandalorian's got it. He's blocking with his armor and stuff. Great action. And the actor fucking who portrays Moff Gideon just really goes for it here. You could feel it. He's really, you know, um, and he's a, a, a fucking hard name to pronounce, right? Or a complicated one. But just really um, great scenes all around. Uh, and, you know, mysteriously, like, people aren't there. Like, you know, you don't see Boba. Well, the reveal at the end is pretty... 
crazy, so you, you realize why people aren't there. But the Dark Troopers, they barely defeat one. Uh, it's getting crazy. He fights the man, only fights Gideon, beats him, and everything looks like it's done. You know, the sh- episode's short enough, so you're like, what the fuck? And then, as they've got uh, Moff Gideon locked up, oh, not locked up, but let's say handcuffed or beaten on the floor, Bo Katan comes in, Cara Dune's there. They're all there. And the ship gets boarded, but there's no life signs. And then you reveal that all the dark troopers are back. The whole platoon, I don't know, let's say 20 of them. They start coming in and they start getting ready to blast in and they're all in this command center. Moff Gideon's doing this play on um, Bo-Katan and the Mandalorian because there's a history with the Dark Blade and since the Mandalorian beat Moff Gideon for it, Bo-Katan has to beat and fight the Mandalorian. The Mandalorian's just like, hey, I'll give it to you. I yield or whatever the fuck, and it's not right. Now, I think of a great uh, conversation you could have added, or maybe they will add, in the future, because it's going to be a contention. It will be part of the story, I believe. Is that, you know, he's like, here, take it, you know, whatever. She's like, you can tell it's not the way. As in, you know, whatever. We call back to the uh, great sayings they've used in the show. I have spoken. This is the way. So I could see her saying, no, you want to hand this back to me, but I have my own set of rules and my guide, you know, my guidelines and my way of life. We have to fight for it. You want to give it back. And you could see the perspective and change it around and go, how long did you not show your face for? For what? A, a belief or for a way of life? So it's serious for her too. So that tension's there, but again, not enough time. <clears throat> no one's watched all the episodes of Rebels or Clone Wars. If you did, you're right in. You're good. If you're not, shame on the show. Make these fucking things over an hour if you have to. But here come the Dark Troopers. They are going to be killed. There's no way to beat these things. One on one, maybe. If they come so close to death, they're locked. They got this whole, they're in a standoff. They got one room left. It's just coming for them. Unstoppable, indestructible death. But, lo and behold, an X-Wing comes. And they're like, oh shit, oh shit, what's this? They turn on the monitors, and the X-Wing pulls into the fucking hangar bay. A figure gets out. Now, people could have noticed the R2 unit on it. It's the four-engine old uh, X-Wing, not the newer ones, which are maybe a thing too. There's some differences, all the nerds and real fucking people way pay more attention than I do will notice a fucking Jedi with a green lightsaber hooded just starts cutting down the fucking Darth Troopers in the hallways and it's reminiscent of Darth Vader's scene I don't think it has as much impact but yes it's done great he's badass Luke Skywalker is fucking up these Darth Troopers like they're nothing crushing them gets to the doorway and when they open up it looks like they're scared of him and, and this whole thing about the bullshit about Jedi being myths, I find it all fucking ridiculous. Totally fucking ridiculous. No one screams out fucking Luke Skywalker? The guy who fucking ended the Empire and Vader? I mean, come on. What bullshit is going on here? Even when you watch the first original Star Wars and Obi-Wan's talking to Luke, oh, he serves your father in the Clone Wars, and like, Jedi's are a myth? And it's like, what? Fucking 20 years ago, there were 10,000. 35, 45 years later? Come on. This is bullshit. We remember World War One, World War II. Now, yes, galactic stuff, misinformation. Yes, you can see it spreading and there being this veil of uncertainty around. But star, stop it, okay? Luke comes into the room, pulls his hood down, and no one pees their pants, shits their pants, or just yells in glee. First off, shitty fucking 3D. Sorry. You got the man himself, Mark Hamill, to stand there. You fucking de-age him, and you do it half ass. it looks to me. I did not like it. You should not have had him speak, because it kind of looks okay if he's not talking. But he talks, and a heartbreaking moment. 
He's got to take Grogu because he has attachments. He needs to learn to use his power. And when Ahsoka spoke to him in that episode five, it was kind of revealed that Grogu was part of the um, Coruscant Jedi, young Jedi's who were getting trained, but he was saved and secreted out of the temple before Anakin killed all the little fucking kids with all the stormtroopers. So, his past is one of being uh, hunted, locked up. He hasn't used his powers. And when Luke comes, he kind of conveys this. Um, he needs you. He wants your permission, he's saying to the Mandalorian, to come. And this is great fucking moment. Another callback, more character development that shows you what this bond meant to them. This father, son. Uh, bounty hunter Mandalorian um, asset uh, mission objective baby Yoda or Grogu and Gro- he holds Grogu and Grogu reaches up with his hand to touch his face but he's got the helmet on and he just takes his helmet off doesn't care about who's on the fucking command center looks at this child who he's bonded with you know it's like you know his father in a way and it's fucking awesome. <clears throat> the emotion, <clears throat> everything conveyed is fucking great. But we have a little bit of a dilemma here because as Luke takes him and they leave, where does the fucking show go? This was such a big part of the show, and I think it's a brave move. Now, what I don't want to see is season three opens up and he's got Grogu again. Let that come naturally if it comes maybe in the future. But we have this weird ending, and it kind of ends there as Luke takes baby Grogu. And I guess in some history we don't know about, we might hear about, apparently Luke Skywalker trained Grogu. You know, who knows if he was killed in the fucking shitty sequel movies, whatever. There's also indications that Ahsoka is one of the voices and why is it a Skywalker? So that means she's dead fine, but you still have 40 years to play with, or whatever the fuck they do, playing with the timelines. But there's a little ending cutscene where we see Tatooine and Jabba's palace. Fennec walking down, Boba Fett, and you see, what's his name, Bib Fortuna, you know, um, Jabba's right hand man running the place. Jabba, good to see you. I thought you were dead. Boom, you're shoots him dead. Boba sits on the throne, and the Book of Boba Fett coming in December 21. Okay, so that's it. That's the season of Mandalorian, season two. I loved it. Some great stuff. But for fucking God's sake, make them longer. Now, I know that the series wouldn't be possible without Boba Fett to begin with in premise, and in premise, right? So... He's a side character, what, a fucking D.E. character in Star Wars, elevated to B, you know, he catches his hand solo, and there's like one line in the whole fucking original trilogy, whatever, but his presence, his aura, his mystery was so captivating, he became beloved, and hand solo, Boba Fett, where, and then hits his fucking jetpack, he slams it to the side of the pit. The Sarlacc monster, whatever the fuck, eats him. All rumors and side content, fan fiction, but there was a legitimate, at the time, canon, where he was, um, he didn't make himself, make his way out, and the enzymes and the digestive fluids had burned his face, and they kept that stuff. But there's a little bit of a plot hole, like, okay, so, the beginning of the movie starts, I mean, the beginning of the show starts, um, on episode so and so, Jang uh, Boba comes and saves Fennec. And what is he doing? Traveling around searching for fucking the Mandalorian, so the Mandalorian will one day encounter the Jawas, and or fucking uh, the Marshal. So where is he doing? Okay, so there's no, there's not enough time, right? So you don't know how long ago Boba got out. Why didn't he go to the Jawas and get it himself? Okay, he goes, he finds, wants to know where his armor is, and he finds out someone took it. So the marshal has it. And he just so happens to track him down, and then it changes hands. And he's got to track 
the Mandalorian for a fucking season to where he shows up in episode six want my father's armor it doesn't make fucking sense but guess what it's done so well you don't give a fuck this isn't the travesty and the fucking destroying of characters and shitty storytelling that the fucking sequels have and I'm talking about The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker I still give The Force Awakens a pass it tried and it had charm and there's a lot to love about it so I'm not thrilled about the Book of Boba Fett I'm not I'm not I'm just not but the show's so fucking good you know how can you not give it a try and there's another spinoff Ahsoka Tana so these will run in the same timelines and it works for me great too as a role player or someone who runs adventures as a GM. I'm going to start a Star Wars um, campaign, but I'm not starting it after the fucking sequels that came out, those garbage fucking disasters. I'm going to set it here. So this is a great place to start a new adventure for players. Five years after, Luke is in Training Jedi. Mandalorian, Ahsoka, Boba Fett the whole world is ripe to play in so I'm so fucking happy but then you hear there's like 10 other spinoffs Kenobi one of the directors from the first season Deborah Chow, I'm totally down for it but that's going to have to be before, right? it's going to have to be him raising not raising, but watching over Luke on Tatooine grow up I'm all for that but what the fuck is Can- Candy and Ass Cassin? Candy and Ass, whatever the fuck his name is, some guy from the Rebels fucking movie or the Rogue Rogue One Rogue One movie, which I did not enjoy. It's a bore fest. Done well, shot well, one of the greatest scenes of Darth Vader ever. But who gives a fuck about the characters? It's bland and boring, except for the fucking robot. I don't want to see a blind force sensitive guy beating the fuck out of stormtroopers and that's another thing at least boba in this thing they give him some weight crazy weapons they're using weapons from like the holiday special fucking thing and it looks like a big fucking metal pipe with spikes on it like, you get that concept like it'll shatter things so when he's hitting stormtroopers anyway candy and Asin, whatever the fuck his name is is just fucking ridiculously stupid so I don't know if they're going to run this fucking mill dry, if they're going to drain any creativity out of it. I get that feeling because they fuck everything up. The last 10, 20 years have been garbage. And I'm giving a little bit of credit to the Clone Wars, which pulled its head out of its ass and finished well. I like Clone Wars in general, although it's fucking hard to get through in the beginning. Rebels, I fucking loved in the beginning. Then I got bogged down in bullshit. I didn't want to watch it every fucking week. I didn't care anymore. The sequels. Fucking disasters. Here is a shining light. It's a ray of light in a fucking tornado of shit. I am fucking holding on. I'm gonna fucking ride this out. I am excited for season 3 of Mandalorian. And as I said before, I was hinting at where do you go? Mandalorian. On his own. Well, you're going to have the turmoil between him and Bo-Katan. He has the dark saber. It's one of those things that needs to reunite the Mandalorian people. It's usually something the leader has. And there's lots of myths and written stuff about that. You can check that out if you want to do deep dives. And as a matter of fact, there is a little tie-in that is kind of hard to understand, but... When the Mandalorian is revealed in his flashbacks in season one, I think it's like episode eight or whatever, you find out his name or something. Uh, he was a child. It was a separatist war. So let's say the prequels, the um, robot fucking droids kill everybody in town. His parents hide him in a bunker. Uh, seemingly the parents are dead. The robot opens up. The, uh, the droid opens up the fucking bunker, goes to kill. Then Dejarin is a kid. And then the droid gets blasted and fucking Mandalorians come down. But one of the things you might not know is those Mandalorians with a death squad, that's who Bo-Katan used to be with. Now, I'm not sure if she left them or they changed to the new 
uh, you know, Bo-Katan's uh, Mandalorian is all dressed in blue. So there's that correlation there between Bo-Katan, her Mandalorians, and there's a name from uh, Clan Rizza, some fucking name. And they used to be Death Squad, and that is tied to him, so there might be some longing for the Mandalorian, Din Djarin, who's a foundling, not a... Because you know, I think Mandalore is a creed, not a race, is how they explain it. So, we're going to get that. Um, apparently, Gina Carano is out. I don't think she's coming back. Again, she's an asshat. You say the stupid things, fine. You could think it, you could you just do it with tact. Do it smart. Don't be a cunt. Fine. And don't pretend that this is um, a good thing, you know. You're lucky. Look, she's in a fucking movie that um, I really fucking love, and she's the star. It's like one of the only movie roles they gave her. Great fucking movie. I love it. I love her performance in it. But she's been, you know, okay, they're going to you know, not use her. No, she could have been Wonder Woman in that sense. I get it. But I do love Gal Gadot performance. I think her her um, shortcomings as an actress lend to that fish out of water, like someone from Themyscira. So I think it works perfectly. But yeah, you want Gina Carano as like She-Hulk. I mean, she's got the physique and she's believable in fighting. And here's the thing. I said this to a friend. Why do you have someone like Gina Carano, who's amazing, real fighter, and you give us some of the stupidest fights I've ever fucking seen in my life. Some of them are great. But they take this cheesiness factor and raise the dial up sometimes, and I don't buy it. And it's almost the same thing they do with Finn, right? Finn in the uh, Force Awakens, he's this stormtrooper trained all his life to serve the cause. They go out and they slaughter a fucking village. He can't fire his weapon. He's having panic attacks. But he's not the brooding fucking killer who's brought out of his shell, but his lovely angel of, you know, Ray and this loving community of resistance fighters and rebels. No, he goes from that to a bumbling fucking idiot. Missed opportunities and bullshit. And I don't know if they're going to do that here. So what do we have? A great fucking season. Season two of The Mandalorian. I love it. Yes, it's got a fucking problems, and you can nitpick this. I'm sure people who are not fanboys like me, or not nerds, who are biased, are going to be able to pick apart these fucking episodes. Tremendously. A lot. Shortness, the editing, the seemingly plot holes. But guess what? The cheesiness, the fact is they're working for the show. These flaws are becoming its charm. The Mandalorian Season 2. I recommend it. Watch season one if you haven't. It's really good. Except for some of the things I've talked about here and there. But on the whole, this is fun. And that, I think, is the point. People's love, their passion is coming through. There's that meme of Dave Filoni and um, uh, someone, uh, George Lucas, I don't know, whatever. Some, just working, uh, John Favreau. And there's a picture of little kids screaming, so excited playing with the toys from the 70s. Like, it's just, yeah, they're kids in a the playground. They're playing with their toys, and it's just awesome to watch. So as much as I pick apart little things that really annoy me, it's because I love it. These short episodes should be fucking remastered. Put more fucking shit into it. You have people who don't know all the stuff. So I would try to correct that. Again, Mandalorian Season 2. I loved it. Go watch it. I hope everybody's doing well. My best to you and yours. Till next time.